on. Hello everyone, welcome uh, to our academic forum um, on uh, teaching practices and evaluations. We've had a few already this year. In September we had a vision for the year with uh, Provost Whitfield, uh, President of the Academic Senate, Lou Romano, and Union Chair Charles Parrish. In October we had a Board of Governors candidates come and do meet and greet. In November we had a forum on gender inequity uh, with uh, Professor Taylor from the University of Waterloo, archivist uh, Alexander Orchard from Wayne State, and Mike Lecha and Scott Barnes from uh, Oakland University. Um, in the, at the beginning of the year, we had a meeting meet and greet with the new Board of Governors, many of uh, whom came to meet the, the members of the, of the union. And today, uh, we are hosting one on teaching practices. We will have at least one more um, by the end of the year, um, and it's, it, there will be also a year-end event. Um, I think maybe we should consider doing one uh, on uh, Sanctuary University as a discussion topic mm -hmm. to talk about. But we should, that, that's up. Or we'll invite the president. Or we can bring the president to <laughs> be on the record. That's right. um, the, the, the purpose of, of the academic forum is to create a space where faculty can discuss issues uh, relevant to their campus and professional lives and staff, um, and then also to empower faculty and staff to have a voice in policy and decision making as we discuss issues that need to be addressed later on. Uh, the academic forum is organized by the council of representatives of the AUPAFT. The chair is Kristen Chinnery. And anyone who has not joined, anyone whose unit is not represented in the council is encouraged to contact Kristen and join. The, the entire project is helped greatly by Michelle Facto, the AUPAFT executive director, Tammy Force, who's here, uh, the AUPAFT Executive Assistant, and Mark Dilley, the AUP Organizer. Thank you all for the effort that you all put in. The process of the um, discussion today is opening statements um, by our panelists and then uh, conversations and questions. The topic today is, is about teaching, but of course teaching is a much broader topic than what we'll cover today. Um, teaching evaluations is what we're focusing on, how best uh, to assess what questions to ask and, and so forth. Um, we'll also probably touch on what is teaching excellence as a matter of discussing teaching evaluations. Um, all the other issues related to teaching, you know, how important should it be at a research university to begin with, what are the differences among different tracks uh, on campus, what is online teaching, um, the teaching itself as a skill, uh, and then, of course, the core curricular issues that Wayne is grappling with all are also part of the broad issue of teaching. But today, we'll focus on the matter of evaluations. Uh, our panelists all have perspectives that they bring to the table from their own uh, perspectives, uh, from their own backgrounds. And I'll introduce them uh, as they're sitting and also mention the specific aspect of which, which they will be addressing in their talks. Rita Casey uh, is currently Vice President of our Local 6075 of the AUPAFT at Wayne State. She's an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology, member of the Clinical and Developmental Psychology areas. In the past, she's been an Advisory Board Member of the Educational Test Testing Service College Level Examination Program. She has been Director of the Merrill Palmer Institute. She has been a member of the Special Advisory Committee on Early Childhood Mental Health uh, a, a committee, an advisory committee set up by President Obama, board member of the Child Care Coordinating Councils of Detroit, Michigan and Iowa City, Iowa, Mayor Dennis Archer's Advisory Committee on Childhood Health and Child Care, board member of Preservation Detroit, board member of the Annie E. Casey Foundation State of Michigan Kids Count, Associate Director of Clinical Training Department of Psychology at Wayne State, and an Assistant Professor at the University of Iowa. Her education includes a PhD in clinical and developmental psychology from the University of Texas, a doctoral internship in clinical psychology at Dartmouth Medical School, master's in curriculum and instruction from the University of Texas. Her grants include support from the National Institutes of Mental Health, National Institutes of Health, and the Spillman Foundation of Detroit. Rita will be speaking on teaching evaluations from the perspective of a tenure track faculty member as well as the, on the union's perspective. Rita, thank you for joining us. Thank you. 
Do you want me to go ahead and talk, or you're going to no, introduce no, let me everybody introduce, else? No, let me introduce good, everyone. Good, good. Next to uh, Rita is Elizabeth Pushek, uh, MD, MS, and MBA, a tenured professor in obstetrics and gynecology at the Wayne State University School of Medicine. She is subspecialty fellowship trained in reproductive, endocrine, and infertility. She actually actively teaches medical students, residents, and fellows. She has published over 100 original manuscripts, reviews, chapters, and books. She is actively involved in writing ultrasound practice guidelines and advising in coding for billing. In addition, Dr. Pushek is the principal investigator in four active industry-sponsored clinical trials, co-investigator in two, and actively participates in the NIH Reproductive Medicine Network grant with its multiple clinical trials. She has done a number of workshops regarding promotion and tenure for the medical school and has participated in university panel discussions on mentoring. Dr. Pushek earned her medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis, where she stayed for her obstetrics and gynecology residency and then did her reproductive endocrinology, endocrinology and infertility fellowship at Medical College of Georgia. She also has taught at Northwestern University for seven years before joining Wayne State. She will, uh, Ms. Pushchek, Dr. Pushchek will talk, will address the unique issues pertaining to clinicians providing evidence of teaching excellence, a topic that is often overlooked in clinical faculty, uh, whether in medicine, nursing, health sciences, or other colleges where they simply cannot use the set course that others do. Uh, Dr. Pushchek, thank you for joining us. And at the end is Timothy Spanos, who is a senior lecturer in learning design and technology at Wayne State University in Detroit. He teaches classes in learning technologies, including web design, multimedia, digital video, and message design. In addition, he directs the Certificate in University Teaching Program uh, at Wayne State. Tim's research and publications center on improving teaching in the university and use of online learning technologies. Current consulting work includes directing development of a curriculum for deacons in the Episcopal Church. His most recent book is Creating Video for Teachers and Trainers, published by Wiley Press. Tim earned his PhD at Wayne State in Instructional Technology. His BS and MS are from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in Radio TV Journals. Tim will be speaking in particular on issues that deal with lectures. He also serves on the Teaching Evaluations Committee uh, with, with Greek dolls. Uh, Tim, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you all, then. Uh, so, maybe to begin, we can begin with statements about uh, these particular areas and see where the conversation goes and what questions from our large audience might come up as well. So, okay. Rita. Well, um, I think that one of the central issues is that is college teaching even important when it comes to evaluating tenure line faculty? We tend to primarily be evaluated on our research productivity, our publications, our grants, things like this. And as my first advisor in graduate school said to me, as long as you don't have sex with your students and don't kill your students, your teaching will be fine. <laughs> That's a very low threshold <laughs> to meet. Uh, and some still don't clear it. But that's <laughs> I was going to say, oh, having had some colleagues who were married to their former students, <laughs> I'm not sure that's really a requirement. Um, but we do have a set thing called the set, the Student Evaluation of Teaching, that is given out to students in our lecture classes at the ends of courses, and it produces numbers. And something that produces numbers takes on extraordinary power and significance as if this is the thing that tells you whether someone does a good job teaching or not. Uh, actually, all of that ratings of things that instructors do doesn't actually get counted. What actually does count is three very broad questions that are in research at other places tend to be things that are most correlated with whether you're a male or a female, whether you're ugly or handsome, whether you're a majority or a minority person in that particular setting. In short, things that we don't usually want to have be a contribution to how we're evaluated. But because we have that, and it's a standard thing, and it's been used for a long time with little tweaks, it has taken on a lot of power. And I have some ideas, which I can talk about a little later, about how you might go beyond that to 
provide some evidence for your teaching that goes you know, into things that you think are really important that aren't just right there in that rating system. So I'm going to stop with that as just sort of a okay, general sorry. introduction. Please, if I can call you Certainly. So um, I'm from the medical school, and we're in a little different setting because when you think about training physicians, we, we train medical students, we train residents, we train fellows, and as we move up that uh, ladder into getting our our physicians out into the real world of practicing medicine or into academics, uh, we see that the education piece changes from being in a classroom setting where it's easier to do set scores to more of a hands-on, almost um, like an apprenticeship kind of training because we're really wanting to see what are the strengths and weaknesses of our students and are they getting the learning objectives that they need to to be a good uh, physician. And so a lot of our teaching then is either at the bedside with rounds, uh, in our office where it's one-on-one -on -one, because we can't have a whole you know, group of 30 students or more coming into an exam room with a patient, it's one-on-one, -on -one, or in the operating room. And when we're doing um, teaching when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's hard to get those evaluations of teaching because obviously there's a, um, a power relationship between the teacher and the student. The student obviously wants to get a good grade too, and they may be a little worried about grading their, uh, their teacher. But it's also very important, as, um, as we see at Wayne State, we, uh, we want to have evaluations of our teaching. One, most of us want to become better teachers, so we want to get that feedback, just like the students want to get feedback on how to become a better uh, physician. I really like to look at it that way. What is my student, or when I speak, what does my audience really want? And I think about what does my student want? They always want feedback. They want to know, are they doing the right thing? Are they coming along the right way for being a, uh, for being a physician? And I, I try to assess that by not only saying, what is our goals in general for you? But I'll ask students as they come on a rotation, uh, and I'm using students in the broad term, whether it's medical students, residents, or fellows, um, what are their personal goals for this rotation? And then I'll share with them my personal goals because I want to see them become the best doctor that they can be. And I want them to tell me at the end of the rotation or in the middle of the rotation, how is it going? Are we meeting your needs? And are things that um, I could be doing differently to help you meet your needs? And so I think if we open this conversation at the beginning and stress how important it is for the trainee to be able to get feedback, it's just as important for us to get feedback from the trainee about are we being effective teachers. So that's one thing I do is open that door and say, hey, it's okay to give me this information. It helps me to not only help you, but to help other trainees down the line. Then the other thing that I find uh, very successful for looking at evidence of um, well, let me finish with that part. So I ask them to, when they're done, to give us an evaluation um, and be frank about it. And I also tell them that we um, put these evaluations into like a group before we share them with other faculty. So we don't get the evaluation immediately after it's filled out by the students. So they have some anonymity there. And I think that helps to get some of those evaluations in. It's still difficult. And so that's one of the things that's really hard on the medical school side is to get those individual evaluations. The other thing I like to look at when we're um, really trying to get those teaching evaluations for our selective salary each year or annually, what we do annually, or when people want to get promoted, we have to have evidence of teaching excellence. How can we define that? How can we demonstrate that there's good teaching or excellent teaching uh, going on for particularly our clinician educators because that's the bulk of what they're doing. That's the bulk of our students and their training is that teaching. And so we want to make sure they're effective. So things that we look at is how successful are our learners? Are our learners getting into the residency programs that they want to get into? Are they getting into the fellowships that they want to get into? That can give us uh, an indicator that they're being successful. If they're being successful, it's because we help them become successful. Uh, we try and engage our students in uh, either research or, or um, case reports, and if we can get them involved in something that gets published, 
then we've mentored them through the process of publication and how academics works. And so we actually at the School of Medicine asterisk those on our, our CVs and annotate at the bottom, this was a trainee, um, and we'll maybe specify which level of train, but that's an indicator of successful teaching if they're actually able to get something published in the literature. And particularly if it's one of our main journals, that's a high level of success. If we see our um, students presenting at national meetings, and we're able to get many of our students presenting at national meetings, again, that not only tells you that they've been successful at learning what we want them to learn when it's, when it's a research project that we're, or, that we've, or a clinical project that we've um, engaged our students, but then they have to be able to field questions. So that not only tells you that they've had the rote memory, but they've had to have active thinking. And that's where the real learning happens, is with the active thinking. And so if they get an oral presentation or a poster presentation, they're going to have that interaction and that networking. That gets the name out of that student. That gets the name of that faculty member out there. That does, gets the name of Wayne State out there. And those are all really good things to show teaching excellence for that, um, that faculty member. And if it can be at a regional or a national level, that's what we're looking for, for both selective salary and for uh, promotion. So that can be very, very helpful. And of course, if they win an award and you've uh, helped them mentor, that, that's even another um, indicator of excellence. And then um, it's hard for clinician educators to get a number of the teaching awards that the School of Medicine has um, or the university has because most of that happens by how many people you touch. And subspecialists may only touch a few people, whereas somebody who's in some of the main courses might get, touch more. So when you get those, those are really like the aha excellence uh, moments for a, a clinician to get. But um, not many are going to get those because we don't have that many awards. So I, I hope uh, that's a good starting point to give you the flavor of how things are at the School of Medicine and how we look for and try to get these teaching evaluations to help us become better teachers and also to uh, show the evidence of excellence as we go forward in our selective salary annually or promotion. So this it seems like anonymity yeah. might be a serious issue though. Case. What is that? I'm sorry. Anonymity might be a serious issue. It is. That's why. Um, well, there, there's. Um, we have something called new innovations, where we can uh, have evaluations sent uh, through um, electronic basis that the um, residency program currently uses. And then there's a different one for the School of Medicine that they use for students to evaluate us. Those can be helpful, but even though those are anonymous. Students don't necessarily feel they're anonymous, okay? <laughs> and yeah. it's the perception of anonymity that's mm -hmm. so important because if they don't perceive it's anonymous, they're not going to be frank about it's it. It's a small group right. after all. I mean, it, it is a small group. So we've um, also put out things like a survey monkey that we right. will uh, give to mm -hmm. our um, trainees and ask them, okay, mm -hmm. You don't have to put any identifiers here. We just know how many people responded. And so we get better feedback on that. Um, and I think that's been one of our best ways to encourage people to give feedback. But uh, I think we actually need to even go further on that. And I'm going to start encouraging our residency program director to, to start um, indicating to learners that this is another method of professionalism. That as we become uh, members of this professional society, that we need to give feedback and constructive feedback. You know, it doesn't help anybody if you say, "Oh, that's a lousy teacher." Well, no, that was, um, you know, this didn't meet my needs in this mm -hmm. area, but it would have been better if it were in that area. So I try to give examples also. But you're exactly right in that anonymity is so important. But that's why starting the conversation it was, at the beginning, open, yeah. saying we give feedback back and forth. And sometimes you actually have to use a sign called feedback. When I was running the medical students, um, I did a whole um, uh, project on feedback. And it was interesting mm -hmm. because students don't always realize feedback is feedback. Um, mm -hmm. If you're giving formative feedback uh, and you don't say, hey, this is feedback, they don't necessarily realize it's right. feedback. It's kind of like when I'm in the operating room and I say, you know, you want to 
cut over here, not over there, or you want to do this kind of technique, then that kind of technique, because this will give you a better result. People don't necessarily realize that's teaching. It's actually very important right. teaching because it's going to make them a better surgeon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of my colleagues at um, Johns Hopkins actually bought a sign and said, she held it up every time she was giving feedback, just so people would realize it. <laughs> well, that was probably a little yep. overkill, yeah. but you know, it, it's important to, to open that conversation and say, this is a two-way street, and it's a professional obligation that we do this back and forth. It's so important. Yeah. I mean, I remember uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and in those days, you, you had to type the final paper, but along the semester, you could, if your handwriting was neat enough, you could hand smaller papers written, handwritten, Mm -hmm. And then when the end of the year evaluations come around, well, they, they professor knows your handwriting. Your handwriting. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So yes. first, you yes. know, they became the best teachers ever uh, because right. you know right. I, I didn't want to say right. anything. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> that that right. atmosphere of being able to make students feel comfortable giving you feedback because mm -hmm. in the real world, yeah. if it's in medicine or if it's in business or whatever, people have to give each other critical feedback, and and mm -hmm. that's really important. And I was thinking, because I've taught, taught residents in pediatrics who were afraid to get feedback from parents, but if you don't get feedback from parents and you're a pediatrician, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to get used to making people comfortable enough to tell you, you know, I'm not happy with this, or I don't understand this, or this didn't tell me what I wanted to do. That actually brings along yeah. one of the techniques that we've uh, recently introduced, or maybe over the last five years, is something called a 360 evaluation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So right. we ask our uh, patients to give mm -hmm. feedback. We ask our MAs and our front desk to give feedback, our nurses mm -hmm. to give feedback to our learners, and that becomes part of their assessment. And we should probably be doing the same thing for our faculty. We don't for the faculty, but it, right. it would be a good way to give right. feedback too. No, Tim, right. uh, where are you on all this, and with lecturers in particular? With lecturers, and I also, um, with Rita, serve on the, on the set 2 n committee, so we can talk about how the evaluation process is changing. But, I and mean, Rita started out by saying, does, does teaching even count? <laughs> that's from the perspective of, of tenure and tenure track. From the perspective of lecturers, yes, that's most of what counts. Um, we're mostly evaluated on our teaching, but mostly evaluated on the limited data that you get from the set. Uh, there's very little other information goes into the process. We get those three questions, questions 1, 2, and 24, um, and those are totaled up in a statistically questionable fashion and reported in statistically questionable fashions, and that becomes the data that evaluates our teaching. Um, that's a fairly scary proposition, and <laughs> it's also one that is probably indefensible were anybody to sue and say I'm not being... Right treated fairly uh, on my teaching evaluations. So, but we're at the forefront of that because four-fifths four, four of our score is teaching, you know, mm -hmm. and the other one is for service. That's, right. wow. So that's, that's pretty heavy. Um, if lecturers want to conduct research and publish, they can do that and also be uh, rated on research. Hmm? In their spare time. In their spare time when we're teaching, exactly. you know, uh, much heavier teaching loads. Um, but the, the concerns that you both have mentioned and others have brought up, how, by the way, how many here are lecturers? Am I the only one? Okay. So I can say anything. Uh, <laughs> no fear of contradiction. Um, the student perception of what's going on with the evaluations, uh, when the evaluations count so much more for lecturers, is really kind of scary because students do not believe that they're really anonymous or confidential. Even when they're turned in electronically on Qualtrics, they say, oh, you know who's, who, who told you, know. you that. Say, no, actually, I don't. Well, you know my handwriting then when we do it, uh, the handwritten form. Actually, no, because everything you turned into me was electronic. I have never seen your handwriting before the set form comes in. Well, but you just know. <laughs> it's hard to get past that. Um, so that's, you know, the student perception that they're not anonymous makes the data somewhat questionable. We, I make it a point when I uh, either send out the, the link for the electronic forms or uh, pass out paper forms in a, in a live class to explain to students what the value of the set is for them and for me. Um, so, you know, I, I've actually used and, and did a paper on this using the diagnostic items that are in the set to improve my teaching. 
um, which it was kind of, kind of a nice use of it and explained that to students. And if they say in there that they're not happy with the feedback, and that mm -hmm. shows up as, a, as an outlier in my scores, figure out what's going on with feedback. Talk to students and, and use the set developmentally rather than as, as a summative uh, punishment process, which is what's built into it. Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, there are better ways of evaluating teaching if, if your continued career at Wayne State depends on good teaching evaluations. There are better ways of doing it than SET. SET's pretty poor on that. Uh, but they're generally not done um, because we haven't set up the, the protocols for it. And I don't have a great deal of confidence that my assistant dean or dean could observe a class and make a good judgment of what's going on there. Uh, if they are not themselves really good teachers or know what to look for or understand, uh, despite my job title, teaching is not lecturing. And if you want to come in and see me teach, I probably will not be lecturing uh, because that's not how I conduct class. And I learned that from feedback from students that they didn't particularly appreciate lecturing. They wanted more hands-on, more practice, more discussion. Um, what else do we do have to do with that? That teaching portfolios are a good way of evaluating teaching, but again, there's not a great deal of evidence that administrators know how to evaluate a teaching portfolio, uh, nor has that become a standardized part of, of work here. But it's, it's certainly collecting artifacts from your students, collecting syllabi, collecting assessments that you do in class, presenting those in an organized fashion with the instructor's reflection is a lot richer than the three numbers from the set score or even an administrator coming in and watching you talk to a class for 10 minutes. So picking up on that, I mean, yeah. so, are you, are you, so are you saying that um, the three questions are insufficient or that that entire method is, is insufficient? I mean, could they add questions to that form to make it a competent form or is that not a way to Yes, do? yes, it could be done. There have been a, I mean, there's a rich literature on student I prefer student ratings of teaching. I don't right. like the idea that students are evaluating the teaching. I think mm -hmm. students can rate teaching. Right. Um, better, better questions and building scales probably off those diagnostic items mm -hmm. that tell you a lot more about what's going on in the classroom than those uh, summative global items. The, as Rita said, the, the global items are subject to a lot of bias mm -hmm. uh, and we treat them statistically very strangely uh, so that but using the diagnostic items probably would give a, a, a richer evaluation. I mean, there are a few questions on the diagnostic items that don't relate at all to those global items, and yet they deal with things that in terms of K-12 uh, learning effective instruction are highly correlated, and those deal much more with the motion. And first among those is, does the instructor, is the instructor enthusiastic about the subject matter, enthusiastic about teaching, and also there's some items that have to do with do the students feel comfortable asking questions, is the instructor someone they can approach, you know, if you're really scary as an instructor, I can think of some of my <laughs> scary faculty, it's like, I don't want to ask him questions, he's going to, you know, slit my throat if I ask the wrong question, but those kinds of things are there in the diagnostic items, and those are really important, those tend to be highly correlated much more so with student achievement, like for high school students. So I suspect they would be for college students as well. But they don't correlate and well to those three global they items. They don't correlate to the global items but at all. But now you're correlating success with teaching. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, in terms of student learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying one of the, one of the things, I have a, a set of additional things I try to do and I've recommended to junior faculty to add to the set. We have to give the set. But I've said, Show them your diagnostic items, you know, put it out there because that tells you things about those emotional qualities of instruction as well as organization and clarity of communication. But I also give my students often a pretest. They're sort of like, this is the first day of class and I have to take a test? <laughs> yeah, but then I give you a test at the end that covers the same thing and so I have some empirical proof that they know more than they did when they started out with it. Uh, but there, there are things you can do. You can ask someone to observe your class that you trust, mm -hmm. that, under, that sees teaching the way you do. And one of the more effective things I ever had to do when I was learning to be a college teacher was I had to write down 
the characteristics of the best college teacher I'd ever had, okay? And it was a combination of enthusiasm, approachability, unbelievable clarity and knowledge of the subject matter, but also being someone that you could talk to easily. And those kinds of things, they're a little bit in the set, mm -hmm. diagnostic items, but not otherwise. But I find that those are important in a classroom setting, or if I'm doing, I do a little bit of the same kind of clinical work that Liz does a lot of in our clinical doctoral program. But I'm saying, I will give students a survey with SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics or something that asks more about those kinds of things and so on. And I also ask explicitly for negative feedback. So I let them know that I don't mind being told something that's, that's less than spectacular. I mean, some students who don't like you will not hesitate <laughs> to use that information. But better that you know than you don't know. Um, it's also important to really know the students well. I, I always pass the thing around, I want to know how many students I have in my class for whom English is not their first language. Because that says something about communication skills, and I report that in my annual thing just so people know I'm, I have to work at it to be able to, to speak clearly. And like it or not, I'm a southerner, so I use a lot of southernisms, figures of speech, like all hat, no cattle, or that dog won't hunt. And I found some students don't know. I put the, <laughs> I put the term border collie on a test two weeks ago. And some of the students in my class thought I was talking about some kind of border policeman and didn't know I was describing a typical family and, you know, this is the family pet. It doesn't say a border collie dog, it says border collie. And they thought, is this the father's occupation, a border guard or something? He's like, no, it's a dog, you know. I was embarrassed at my stupidity and using a term that was familiar to me and not familiar to them. But I also encourage students to write down what they don't understand. If they can't come to me, they can send me an email or post it on a list or whatever. I actually There's have to different do something ways. similar because I have an accent. Yeah. I tell them I can't change it, sorry. I so know. You need to come, come, <laughs> come slow down or repeat it or come see Right, me. right. Tim, did I interrupt you, Tim? Did, were you finished with your... Um, uh, I had a couple yeah, okay. more things. It's all right. Um, won't take long. But because lecturers... Um, focus on teaching, one of the results is that we, we tend to experiment a little bit more with our teaching. We try different instructional strategies. We were the first ones with the most online teaching. And as a consequence of trying things out in class, sometimes your set scores will drop. And right. the first couple of years I taught online, my set scores dropped precipitously. They've come back up. But uh, it takes a while to figure out what works well in that different environment. And, uh, even if we don't trust the sets, that's what's out there, so how do, you, how do you get the score back up? And with a new instructional strategy, if you're trying to do more of a, say, a studio method in a class that's been, been primarily discussion, uh, the first semester probably won't go so well, and sets will, will go down. It's necessary to explain that, but if you've got somebody who's uh, an administrator who's reviewing your P&T &T and say, man, you had a bad year. I guess, we, right. you know, you're not going to get a, a merit raise this year. Well, I was trying new, new instructional strategies, and it takes a while to get them to work. Um, but particularly when you're trying something new, it's important to do that midterm or partway through the semester or a couple times during the semester. Take the temperature of the class. Qualtrics does it very nicely, but there are many other tools that will do it. And ask specifically about things in that class, which SET doesn't do. So that is supposed to work across the entire university, which it doesn't quite do. But ask, you know, how, how did this activity work? Mm -hmm. How could it be made better? So you're, you're asking for feedback. And what it also tells the students is, I'm interested in what's going on in this class. I'm asking the question because I can improve it while you're still in my class, right. rather than okay. getting data two or three months after the end of the semester when it's too late to do anything right. about it. Formative versus summative. Formative versus summative, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, how would you take into account um, environmental factors that can seriously affect a class, that is, a large class, a 200% class, mm -hmm. let's say, versus, uh, or else a required class, as opposed mm -hmm. to where, where, you know, as opposed to an optional class, where they choose, they, they like the topic to begin with, and so there's mm -hmm. a built-in sort of credit uh, of goodwill as they come into the class. 
Uh, and there are a number of these sorts of things that, that, that are not anywhere in the evaluation system. Should they be taken into account in, when, when considering? Uh, required versus elective is actually one of the questions on the set, but I'm not, not sure that people pay a whole lot of attention well, to it. Not part of the, how does it affect the number? That it doesn't affect the number at all. It doesn't affect the number at all. It doesn't affect the number. It's not affected in any way. Right. I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to do in adjusting the set is right now there's a, an effort to compare your average set rating to the average of all the ratings from your faculty members in your unit, which is sort of like, hmm, I, I don't want to think about the average food item being used <laughs> to compare individual meals at a fancy restaurant. And that's, that's basically what you have. It's just real important to try to communicate that to whoever is reading uh, your annual review. Uh, I think it's really important to have those explanations mm -hmm. because if you can't somehow communicate, that's why one of my recommendations is talk to your chair about the things that you're doing new. If you're trying out a new, a new method, a new, a new course, a new organization, is talk to them ahead of time. If you have a faculty mentor, which many junior faculty do before they're you know, promoted, uh, talk to them about what you're doing because you want the word to kind of spread that you're doing something new and different for you and trying that out and that you expect that that's just going to affect your teaching rating. So some people in your area know that you're trying something out different. It just helps the understanding and then they can sometimes give you feedback about how do you communicate that as well. Um, Liz, uh, I haven't said anything in a while. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you've, uh, you brought out a, a lot of good uh, items that we um, all, all share, actually. So I don't think I have anything more to add on that aspect of it. Um, one of the things that we also do is uh, we try and set up an evaluation. Well, let me, let me add this part of it. So you mentioned having peers view you teaching, mm -hmm. and I think that's right. great. Sometimes you can get the Office of Teaching and Learning to help do that, yeah. and that can be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you can also have done is you can have your uh, teaching videotaped. Mm -hmm. right. And as right. we ask our learners to do self-assessments, we should be doing our mm -hmm. own self-assessment right. by being videotaped and then looking at, mm -hmm. well, I didn't realize I was always, you know, pulling my hair or doing whatever it is I'm doing that might be distracting right. my learner. Yeah. Maybe I could do this a little different. Or mm -hmm. I thought I covered this, and look, I just missed this whole piece. You know, right. and it gives you right. some insight on how you yourself can be better. And I think when you self-evaluate, that can be really mm -hmm. helpful and powerful to um, have you become a, a better teacher. So I, I strongly recommend that, and the Office of Teaching and Learning can help with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and I participated in a, a Center for Teaching Excellence when I was at Northwestern, and they gave a whole seminar on what do excellent teachers do. And mm -hmm. that was one of the things that they also found very helpful. And maybe we want to put on a, a seminar mm -hmm. like that at some point right. in the future, right. because that helps us mm -hmm. become better teachers as, uh, as we look at what's been effective across the country, not right. just at our own location. Right. Well, yeah, I go along with that videotaping too. I mean, I'm lucky I have a camera, cameras in my lab so I can haul them into the room, and I do that when I'm teaching new class. I found out, for example, that if this, I'm teaching 400 students in intro psych. These poor folks over here on this side, they're in the middle of my dead zone. <laughs> <laughs> you never look that so way. So <laughs> it's, oh boy. So I will even have students on that side sit with the diagram and note every time I look at them, which the fact of simply being <laughs> monitored keeps me, you know, paying attention. And I also walk back and forth when I teach too. I don't usually teach sitting down. But it's a humbling experience to see yourself on camera uh, being videotaped. But you get over it pretty soon and, and it can really help. And for some junior faculty, I even think it helps to include a few clips. You know, you can turn in a memory stick or something or a disc mm -hmm. with your stuff that goes in for tenure, for example, and it's really powerful. You don't have to have a whole class, but you can have clips of what you do, and I think that helps people grasp what you're trying at who sitting in a whole class might not catch at all. Yeah, let me ask a broader question, or just taking a step back. So there's an aspect to this, which, which is, um, an educational for the faculty member teaching. So you get evaluations back so you can improve your teaching, address issues that need improving and so on. 
But there's an, a side of it that's tied to uh, salary, mm -hmm. that's tied to administrative evaluation. Yes. Um, do, can you not, can you do away with that part? Because what the quantifying of all of this does, it forces metrics on something that's sometimes very difficult to quantify. It changes relationships between faculty and students. You know, you have to please students in some way. You have to be aware of pleasing students in some way. It can make a class that might be much more challenging, you know, brought down many notches so that the students aren't that challenged and don't complain as much. Um, it, and I've seen all of these things happen. Uh, yeah. Or grading might become easier so that students are left more pleased at, at the end of the class. It changes instruction in subtle and not so subtle ways because there's an evaluation of your salary sort of tied at the end of it. It's not just simply getting information about how you can improve and be a better teacher. Um, is, have you considered uh, essentially decoupling the, the numbers from the salary structure, uh, from the, from the uh, reward system? Well, that wouldn't work for lecturers. <laughs> 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 because I mean, we're paid to teach. Um, the, the numbers that are currently used are, are not great. But I, I think we, I think it is appropriate that we're evaluated on teaching if, you know, if our three roles are teaching, publication, and, and service. So we, we need to reward that. Um, but I also want to, you know, you know there, there's a widely held perception out there, which you echoed, that if you want to get a better teaching evaluation, make the class easier. Um, in the research that's been done on that, it hasn't necessarily held up. The more difficult classes do, in fact, get good evaluations if the instructor shows, I mean, those things that Rita was talking about, respect for the students, um, offers plenty of opportunity to ask questions, all those, you know, interpersonal things that really improve teaching, shows enthusiasm uh, for the students and wants students to, for the subject and wants students to succeed. So um, I think it, there's, I, I would argue that there still needs to be a couple between teaching quality and merit raises in P and T, I would argue that we should measure teaching quality better, better, better than we do. Than we do. Okay. Exactly. Is that everyone's basically, you, you think it's, there is value in quantifying this experience? I, I, I would uh, go with the idea of, you know, inspect what you expect. You know, if you don't want to have good teaching, take it off. Take it off. Take it off. Right. But if you want to have good teaching, you need to have some metric to evaluate it, and you need to right. reward that. Mm -hmm. um, and. And it is a vital part. We're mm -hmm. a school. We're a university. We're, we, we're, public, we're public servants. <laughs> you know? We're supposed to be serving the public good. And if we, if we can't do that, it's like, I want every faculty member to res have some kind of respect for the students. And yet I've had faculty not here, but in places where I was taught, who had no respect for students mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. You know, They were really into their research and their subject matter, and it was like, kind of scary to have them sometimes, or very boring to have them as a faculty member. Um, that's well, not good. Um, let me, let's, maybe we can come to a conclusion and, and, and see if there are any questions. And maybe we can begin with uh, Rita uh, talking about the, the joint committee that you're on and where it's taking this, this, this discussion and, and process. And then I'll ask each of you to also make a mm -hmm. comment to, to okay. close it. Well, we have changed the diagnostic items. Uh, quite a bit on the set and made it clear that they're student perceptions, that they're not student ratings. So we've changed the wording. What we haven't been allowed to do thus far is to change those three items that have a special term mm -hmm. that we called, and I'll let you share that special term. <laughs> <laughs> but it's sort of like, we can't use these because we've always used them. Mm -hmm. you know. And we have people coming up for tenure, and they've had them every year for six years, so we can't ever stop them. So, I'm, so I said, you know, so in 2050, we're still using the same global items <laughs> because we were using them in 2015. Uh, but it's been a gradual process. Half the committee is uh, administrators, and half are chosen by the union. In practice, some of the administrators have faded out pretty quickly. Um, but I will say it has been really good to work with uh, Matt Olette, who's director of the Office of Teaching and Learning, and Laura Woodward, who actually administers the set and analyzes it and sends our results back. They're really good about wanting to do a better job in the OTL. That office just does a lot of stuff that helps people. So we're still working, and I think we are at a point of 
of altering and making some changes to those three items. I think the committee's more open to it now than it ever has been. As we're on the topic, let me ask. Yeah, because I'm, I'm also on that. By the way, we're down one faculty member to yeah. set right now, to set two we in. We need one more person. So if, if yeah. this is something of interest to you, talk to Rita. <laughs> <laughs> or Tim. But, yeah, but there are, um, yeah. We've revised the diagnostic items, and we think they're they're performing better, giving mm -hmm. us better data than were there. We also, uh, as part of this set two in, students can look at those diagnostic items if they're when they're registering for a class. They can click on the faculty name and see data. They do not see the the global three because we don't trust those. But they can see does this professor seem organized, does mm -hmm. professor respect students, encourage discussion, all, you know, encourage questions, all those things, which would be helpful for a student. Uh, right. Even if there's only one person teaching the class, at least they get an idea of what to expect in the class right. um, and how they might adjust their study practice depending on what they see about the professor going in. So making some of the data available, which had been true a long time ago, but is now you know, making it online makes it cheap, has been good. We've been trying to improve the reports just by improving response rates because the better the response rate the better the data uh, so there's been you've seen marketing campaigns and the videos and all sorts you know emails to faculty of, of how to improve response rates because if you only get 10 or 20 percent of your students responding the data is not trustworthy unless you have very very large classes <laughs> the numbers just aren't there so those are you know the things that we're trying to continue working on those beauty contest items. Is that, is that the term you were looking for? <laughs> <laughs> um, or we might actually get rid of one of those. Yeah, there's so one I think like we one can, is gonna, gonna that go. just correlates with nothing. So yeah. <laughs> I'd like to add one more uh, thing that you have the last word. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk about the sets course, but I'd like to bring out a, another area that people can use, at least at the School of Medicine, there's something called a MedEd Portal. So this is a national uh, portal that people can submit their curriculum, they can submit their uh, lectures, their PowerPoints, and uh, it actually goes through a peer review process, mm -hmm. and when it is accepted and deemed excellent, it is then posted on the MedEd portal, which is free wow. to other lecturers and teachers to use. So you can actually then use somebody else's curriculum or use somebody else's lecture on a particular area or topic. Maybe you haven't put one together and you want to look at it. What did somebody else do? And how can I do that better? Well, that is another way, since it's a peer review mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. it's demonstrating mm -hmm. teaching excellence, and mm -hmm. it broadens that evaluation of teaching from not just lectures or one-on-one, -on -one, but to your curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have evaluations of curriculum um, no. as good as we should. I mean, that's right. really critical. And if you're going to, if you really want to teach someone, you have to think about what your curriculum is and make sure that you're really addressing the needs of the learner. And so this is one way to do it that will, then you can put it on your CV and you can put it uh, on something that, that can be evaluated in your selective salary or annual review. And I do strongly support the teaching portfolio. Maybe we don't know how to evaluate it. We have this teaching grid that everybody looks at the you know, whether there's numbers or not there, but it is an evaluation that is still mm -hmm. subjective and quality-based, and we need to think about that as we look at excellence mm -hmm. in teaching. Very good. Well, thank you, everyone, Rita, Liz, and, and Tim. Thank you for joining us. So, time, time for questions. Uh,